King Solomon's Mines by H. Ryder Haggard Chapter 12 Before the Battle Luckily for us, Infadus and the chiefs knew all the paths of the great town perfectly, so that we passed by sideways unmolested, and notwithstanding the gloom, we made fair progress. For an hour or more we journeyed on, till at length the eclipse began to pass, and that edge of the moon which had disappeared the first became again visible. Suddenly, as we watched, there burst from it a silver streak of light, accompanied by a wondrous ruddy glow, which hung upon the blackness of the sky like a celestial lamp, and a wild and lovely sight it was. In another five minutes the stars began to fade, and there was sufficient light to see our whereabouts. We then discovered that we were clear of the town of Lu, and approaching a flat-topped hill measuring some two miles in circumference. This hill, which is of a formation common in South Africa, is not very high. Indeed, its greatest elevation is scarcely more than 200 feet. But it is shaped like a horseshoe, and its sides are rather precipitous and strewn with boulders. On the grass tableland at its summit is ample camping ground, which had been utilized as a military cantonment of no mean strength. Its ordinary garrison was one regiment of 3,000 men, but as we toiled up the steep side of that mountain in the returning moonlight, we perceived that there were several of such regiments encamped there. Reaching the tableland at last, we found crowds of men roused from their sleep, shivering with fear, and huddled up together in the utmost consternation at the natural phenomenon which they were witnessing. Passing through these without a word, we gained a hut in the center of the ground, where we were astonished to find two men waiting, laden with our few good and chattels, which of course we had been obliged to leave behind in our hasty flight. I sent for them, explained Infadus, and also for these, and he lifted up Good's long lost trousers. With an exclamation of rapturous delight, Good sprang at them and instantly proceeded to put them on. "'Surely my lord will not hide his beautiful white legs,' exclaimed Infadus regretfully. But Good persisted, and only once did the Kukuwana people get the chance of seeing his beautiful legs again. Good is a very modest man. Henceforward they had to satisfy their aesthetic longings with his one whisker, his transparent eye, and his movable teeth. Still gazing with fond remembrance at Good's trousers, Infadus next informed us that he had commanded the regiment to muster so soon as the day broke, in order to explain to them fully the origin and circumstances of the rebellion which was decided on by the chiefs, and to introduce to them the rightful heir of the throne, Ignosi. Accordingly, when the sun was up, the troops in all some twenty thousand men, and the flower of the Kukuana army, were mustered on a large open space to which we went. The men were drawn up in three sides of a dense square, and presented a magnificent spectacle. We took our station on the open side of the square, and were speedily surrounded by all the principal chiefs and officers. These after silence had been proclaimed, Infadus proceeded to address. He narrated to them in vigorous and graceful language, for like most Kukuanas of high rank, he was a born orator, the history of Ignosi's father, and of how he had been basely murdered by Twala the king, and his wife and child driven out to starve, then he pointed out that the people suffered and groaned under Twala's cruel rule, 
instancing the proceedings of the previous night, when under pretense of their being evildoers, many of the noblest in the land had been dragged forth and wickedly done to death. Next he went on to say that the white lords from the stars, looking down upon their country, had perceived its trouble, and determined at great personal inconvenience to alleviate its lot, that they had accordingly taken the real king of the Kukuanas, Ignosi, who was languishing in exile, by the hand, and led him over the mountains, that they had seen the wickedness of Twala's doings, and for a sign to the wavering, and to save the life of the girl Fulata, actually, by the exercise of their high magic, had put out the moon and slain the young fiend Scraga, and that they were prepared to stand by them, and assist them to overthrow Twala, and set up the rightful king Ignosi in his place. He finished his discourse amidst a murmur of approbation. Then Ignosi stepped forward and began to speak. Having reiterated all that Infadus, his uncle, had said, he concluded a powerful speech in these words, O chiefs, captains, soldiers, and people, ye have heard my words. Now must ye make choice between me and him who sits upon my throne, the uncle who killed his brother and hunted his brother's child forth to die in the cold and the night. That I am indeed the king, these, pointing to the chiefs, can tell you, for they have seen the snake about my middle. If I were not the king, would these white men be on my side with all their magic? Tremble, chiefs, captains, soldiers, and people. Is not the darkness... They have brought upon the land to confound Twala and cover our flight, darkness even in the hour of the full moon, yet before your eyes. It is, answered the soldiers. I am the king. I say to you, I am the king, went on Ignosi, drawing up his great stature to its full and lifting his broad-bladed battle-axe above his head. If there be any man among you who says that it is not so, let him stand forth, and I will fight him now, and his blood shall be a red token that I tell you true. Let him stand forth, I say. And he shook the great axe till it flashed in the sunlight. As nobody seemed inclined to respond to this heroic version of Dilly Dilly, come and be killed, our late henchman proceeded with his address. I am indeed the king, and should ye stand by my side in the battle, if I win the day, ye shall go with me to victory and honor. I will give you oxen and wives, and ye shall take place of all the regiments, and if ye fall, I will fall with you. And behold, I give you this promise, that when I sit upon the seat of my fathers, bloodshed shall cease in the land. No longer shall ye cry for justice to find slaughter. No longer shall the witch-finder hunt you out so that ye may be slain without a cause. No man shall die, save he who offends against the law. The eating up of your kraals shall cease. Each one of you shall sleep secure in his own hut, and fear not, and justice shall walk blindfold throughout the land. Have ye chosen chiefs, captains, soldiers, and people? We have chosen, O king, came back the answer. It is well. Turn your heads and see how Twala's messengers go forth from the great town, east and west, and north and south, to gather a mighty army to slay me and you, and these my friends and protectors. Tomorrow, or perchance the next day, he will come against us with all who are faithful to him. Then I shall see the man who is indeed my man, 
the man who fears not to die for his cause, and I tell you that he shall not be forgotten in the time of spoil. I have spoken, O chiefs, captains, soldiers, and people. Now go to your huts and make you ready for war. There was a pause, till presently one of the chiefs lifted his hand, and out rolled the royal salute. Groom! It was a sign that the soldiers accepted Ignosi as their king. Then they marched off in battalions. Half an hour afterwards we held a council of war, at which all the commanders of regiments were present. It was evident to us that before very long we should be attacked in overwhelming force. Indeed, from our point of vantage on the hill, we could see troops mustering, and runners going forth from Loo in every direction, doubtless to summon soldiers to the king's assistance. We had on our side about 20,000 men, composed of seven of the best regiments in the country. Twala, so Infadus and the chiefs calculated, had at least thirty to 35,000 on whom he could rely at present assembled in Lu, and they thought that by midday on the morrow he would be able to gather another 5,000 or more to his aid. It was, of course, possible that some of his troops would desert and come over to us, but it was not a contingency which could be reckoned on. Meanwhile, it was clear that active preparations were being made by Twala to subdue us. Already strong bodies of armed men were patrolling round and round the foot of the hill, and there were other signs also of coming assault. Infadus and the chiefs, however, were of opinion that no attack would take place that day, which would be devoted to preparation and to the removal of every available means of the moral effect produced upon the minds of the soldiery by the supposed magical darkening of the moon. The onslaught would be on the morrow, they said, and they proved to be right. Meanwhile, we set to work to strengthen the position in all ways possible. Almost every man was turned out, and in the course of the day, which seemed far too short, much was done. The paths up the hill, that was rather a sanatorium than a fortress, being used generally as the camping place of regiments suffering from recent service in unhealthy portions of the country, were carefully blocked with masses of stones, and every other approach was made as impregnable as time would allow. Piles of boulders were collected at various spots to be rolled down upon an advancing enemy. Stations were appointed to the different regiments, and all preparation was made which our joint ingenuity could suggest. Just before sundown, as we rested after our toil, we perceived a small company of men advancing towards us from the direction of Lou, one of whom bore a palm leaf in his hand for a sign that he came as a herald. As he drew near, Ignosi, Infadus, one or two chiefs, and ourselves went down to the foot of the mountain to meet him. He was a gallant-looking fellow, wearing the regulation leopard-skin coat. "'Greetings!' he cried as he came near. THE KING'S GREETINGS TO THOSE WHO MAKE UNHOLY WAR AGAINST THE KING, THE LION'S GREETING TO THE JACKALS THAT SNARL AROUND HIS HEELS. SPEAK, I SAID. THESE ARE THE KING'S WORDS. SURRENDER TO THE KING'S MERCY ERE A WORSE THING BEFALL YOU. ALREADY THE SHOULDER HAS BEEN TORN FROM THE BLACK BULL, AND THE KING DRIVES HIM BLEEDING ABOUT THE CAMP. This cruel custom is not confined to the Kukuanas, but is by no means uncommon amongst African tribes on the occasion of the outbreak of war or any other important public event. Alan Quartermain. What are Twala's terms? I asked from curiosity. 
His terms are merciful, worthy of a great king. These are the words of Twala, the one-eyed, the mighty, the husband of a thousand wives, lord of the Kukuanas, keeper of the great road, Solomon's road, beloved of the strange ones who sit in silence at the mountains yonder, the three witches, calf of the black cow, elephant whose tread shakes the earth, terror of the evildoer, ostrich whose feet devour the desert, huge one, black one, wise one, king from generation to generation, these are the words of Twala. I will have mercy and be satisfied with a little blood. One in every ten shall die. The rest shall go free. But the white man, Incubu, who slew Scraga, my son, and the black man, his servant, who pretends to my throne, and Infadus, my brother, who brews rebellion against me, these shall die by torture as an offering to the silent ones. Such are the merciful words of Twala. After consulting with the others a little, I answered him in a loud voice, so that the soldiers might hear, thus, Go back, thou dog, to Twala, who sent thee, and say that we, Ignosi, veritable king of the Kukuanas, Incubu, Buguan, and Makumazan, the wise ones from the stars who make dark the moon, Infadus of the royal house, and the chiefs, captains, and people here gathered, make answer and say that we will not surrender, that before the sun has gone down twice, Twala's corpse shall stiffen at Twala's gate, and Ignosi, whose father Twala slew, shall reign in his stead. Now go, ere we whip thee away, and beware how thou dost lift a hand against such as we are. The herald laughed loudly. Ye frighten not men with such swelling words, he cried out. Show yourselves as bold to-morrow, O ye who darken the moon. Be bold, fight, and be merry. Before the crows pick your bones till they are whiter than your faces. Farewell. Perhaps we may meet in the fight. Fly not to the stars, but wait for me, I pray, white men. With this shaft of sarcasm he retired, and almost immediately the sun sank. That night was a busy one, for, weary as we were, so far as was possible by the moonlight, all preparations for the morrow's flight were continued, and messengers were constantly coming and going from the place where we sat in council. At last, about an hour after midnight, everything that could be done was done, and the camp, save for the occasional challenge of a sentry, sank into silence. Sir Henry and I, accompanied by Ignosi and one of the chiefs, descended the hill and made a round of the pickets. As we went, suddenly, from all sorts of unexpected places, spears gleamed out in the moonlight, only to vanish again when we uttered the password. It was clear to us that none were sleeping at their posts, then we returned, picking our way warily through thousands of sleeping warriors, many of whom were taking their last earthly rest. The moonlight, flickering along their spears, played upon their features and made them ghastly. The chilly night wind tossed their tall and hearse-like plumes. There they lay in wild confusion with arms outstretched and twisted limbs, their stern, stalwart forms looking weird and unhuman in the moonlight. How many of these do you suppose will be alive at this time tomorrow? asked Sir Henry. I shook my head and looked again at the sleeping men, and to my tired and yet excited imagination, 
it seemed as though death had already touched them. My mind's eye singled out those who were sealed to slaughter, and there rushed in upon my heart a great sense of the mystery of human life, and an overwhelming sorrow at its futility and sadness. Tonight these thousands slept their healthy sleep. Tomorrow they, and many others with them, ourselves perhaps among them, would be stiffening in the cold, their wives would be widows, their children fatherless, and their place know them no more forever. Only the old moon would shine on serenely, the night wind would stir the grasses, and the wide earth would take its rest, even as it did eons before we were, and will do eons after we have been forgotten. Yet man dies not, whilst the world, at once his mother and his monument, remains. His name is lost, indeed, but the breath he breathed still stirs the pine tops on the mountains, the sound of the words he spoke yet echoes on through space. The thoughts his brain gave birth to we have inherited today. His passions are our cause of life. The joys and sorrows that he knew are our familiar friends. The end from which he fled aghast will surely overtake us also. Truly the universe is full of ghosts not sheeted churchyard specters, but the inextinguishable elements of individual life, which having been can never die, though they blend and change, and change again forever. All sorts of reflections of this nature pass through my mind, for as I grow older I regret to say that a detestable habit of thinking seems to be getting a hold of me. While I stood and stared at those grim yet fantastic lines of warriors, sleeping, as their saying goes, upon their spears. Curtis, I said, I am in a condition of pitiable fear. Sir Henry stroked his yellow beard and laughed, and he answered, I have heard you make that sort of remark before, Quartermain. Well, I mean it now. Do you know, I doubt very much if one of us will be alive tomorrow night. We shall be attacked in overwhelming force, and it is quite a chance if we can hold this place. We'll give a good account of some of them, at any rate. Look here, Quartermain, this business is nasty, and one with which, properly speaking, we ought not to be mixed up. But we are in for it, so we must make the best of our job. Speaking personally, I had rather be killed fighting than any other way. And now that there seems little chance of our finding my poor brother, it makes the idea easier to me. But fortune favors the brave, and we may succeed. Anyway, the battle will be awful, and having a reputation to keep up, we shall need to be in the thick of the thing. He made this last remark in a mournful voice, but there was a gleam in his eye which belied its melancholy. I have an idea Sir Henry Curtis actually likes fighting. After this, we went to sleep for a couple of hours or so. Just about dawn we were awakened by Infadus, who came to say that great activity was to be observed in Lu, and that parties of the king's skirmishers were driving in our outposts. We rose and dressed ourselves for the fray, each putting on his chain armor shirt, for which garments at the present juncture we felt exceedingly thankful. Sir Henry went the whole length about the matter and dressed himself like a native warrior. When you are in Kukuana land, do as the Kukuanas do, he remarked, as he drew the shining steel over his broad breast, which it fitted like a glove. 
nor did he stop there. At his request, Infadus had provided him with a complete set of native war uniform. Round his throat he fastened the leopard-skin cloak of a commanding officer. On his brows he bound the plume of black ostrich feathers worn only by generals of high rank, and about his middle a magnificent mukha of white ox-tails. A pair of sandals, a leglet of goat's hair, a heavy battle-axe with a rhinoceros horn handle, a round iron shield covered with white ox-hide, and the regulation number of twalas or throwing knives, made up his equipment, to which, however, he added his revolver. The dress was no doubt a savage one, but I am bound to say that I seldom saw a finer sight than Sir Henry Curtis presented in this guise. It showed off his magnificent physique to the greatest advantage, and when Ignosi arrived presently arrayed in a similar costume, I thought to myself that I had never before seen two such splendid men. As for Good and myself, the armor did not suit us nearly so well. To begin with, Good insisted upon keeping on his new-found trousers, and a stout, short gentleman with an eyeglass, and when half of his face shaved, arrayed in a male shirt, carefully tucked into a very seedy pair of corduroys, looks more remarkable than imposing. In my case, the chain shirt being too big for me, I put it on over all my clothes, which caused it to bulge in a somewhat ungainly fashion. I discarded my trousers, however, retaining only my veltskuns, having determined to go into battle with bare legs in order to be the lighter for running, in case it became necessary to retire quickly. The mail coat, a spear, a shield that I did not know how to use, a couple of twalas, a revolver, and a huge plume, which I pinned into the top of my shooting hat in order to give a bloodthirsty finish to my appearance, completed my modest equipment. In addition to all these articles, of course, we had our rifles, but as ammunition was scarce, and as they would be useless in case of a charge, we arranged that they should be carried behind us by bearers. When at length we had equipped ourselves, we swallowed some food hastily, and then started out to see how things were going on. At one point in the tableland of the mountain, there was a little copy of brown stone, which served the double purpose of headquarters and of a conning tower. Here we found Infadus surrounded by his own regiment, the Greys, which was undoubtedly the finest in the Kukuana army, and the same that we had first seen at the outlying corral. This regiment, now 3,500 strong, was being held in reserve, and the men were lying down on the grass in companies and watching the king's forces creep out of loo in long, ant-like columns. There seemed to be no end to the length of these columns, three in all, and each of them numbering, as we judged, at least eleven or twelve thousand men. As soon as they were clear of the town, the regiments formed up. Then one body marched off to the right, one to the left, and the third came on slowly towards us. Ah, said Infadus, they are going to attack us on three sides at once. This seemed rather serious news, for our position on the top of the mountain, which measured a mile and a half in circumference, being an extended one, it was important to us to concentrate our comparatively small defending force as much as possible. But since it was impossible for us to dictate in what way we should be assailed, we had to make the best of it, and accordingly sent orders to the various regiments to prepare to receive the separate onslaughts. End of chapter 12